In this lesson we're going to be continuing with our look at trigonometric functions and in particular the idea of modeling with trigonometric functions which is actually a very important and very useful application of trigonometric functions particularly sine and cosine which is what I'll be focusing on in this lesson. So if you're given some data uh, whether that's a graph, table of values, or even a description, it is possible to model that data as an equation. And that doesn't necessarily have to be trigonometry. We're focusing on trigonometry today, but that could be any kind of equation. Maybe it's a polynomial, maybe it's a quadratic, maybe it's a cubic, or maybe it's uh, exponential logarithmic. So there are lots of different algebraic models that we can come up with to describe a situation. But we want these models to be good approximations of the situation. Most real life, uh, most real life conditions, they are going to be approximations. You need to keep that in mind. Even the best real world data is not going to perfectly match uh, an algebraic model, simply because the the real world doesn't act perfectly. There are always other factors getting involved that tend to uh, make a mess, either a small mess or a very large mess. Along those lines, sometimes you are able to come up with a model that is actually really good, but it's only good for some sort of limited domain. So you might come up with a, a trigonometric model based on sine or cosine, and it may be really good at describing, for example, I don't know, the cycle of the tides for the first 24 hours that you took measurements. But then other variability, other changes, because the tides, for example, they are affected by cycles of the moon or the rotation of the moon around the earth. But there are other things. The sun actually has an effect on the tides as well. So uh, you might be able to take a good set of measurements over one day, but if you try to go further than that, then uh, the effects of the sun might start to come into play. And you could create another model to try to account for both of them at the same time, but then the non-spherical nature of the Earth might come into play. There are a bunch of different factors that can, that can work together to make your models uh, not always applicable. So that's something else you really need to keep in mind. And that's one of the reasons why we talk about the domain of a real world problem. Um, sometimes there are restrictions on the domain for that reason. Sometimes there are restrictions on your model for that reason. So whenever you're doing this, you, you want to do your best, come up with the best model that you can, understand that it is at best an approximation, fall back on the other data you were given. For example, if you have a graphical representation or if you've got some text, you can use all of these factors together, all of these pieces of information together to try to interpret the situation and arrive at whatever conclusions or answer whatever questions you're looking for. But understand that this is really, this is, this is a, uh, a direction that real applications of math, this is an important application of mathematics. A lot of science has to do with mathematical models of various natural phenomena. And um, so this is getting close to real useful mathematics. So let's take a look at an example here. So I've got some sample data. Determine an algebraic model for the following data. And I will admit to you, even this sample data, I created this sample data. I started with, uh, in this case, you can see this This is a sinusoidal curve. So I started with either a sine or a cosine, but I, I corrupted the data enough so that we can still see that basic shape, right? There's still some sort of basic sine shape here, but you can also see that there isn't just one. I could, there are, there are others that I could run through this data. I mean, some are, some are better and some are worse, of course. And one of our goals is to come up with, with the best approximation for this that we possibly can. So in taking a look at this and, and just that basic idea of a sign, now this would be one of those cases where I think it would actually be very difficult to try to draw the graph over top of this right away. So I'm going to take a very simple strategy here and I'm going to show you the result of that strategy and then talk about how we could have improved that a little bit. So if you're following along with this, I want you to take a look at, well, how would you do this? Or even as I'm making particular decisions, you might look at that and say, you know what, that you could have done better in that decision. So what I'm going to do is, when, well, looking at this large graph, um, 
I take a look at this and I see, okay, and I'm, I'm going to be making decisions. I'm going to do this in a very simple-minded way. And I don't mean that in an insulting way. I mean in the, the most direct and easiest way that I can. So, for example, one of the things I'm going to do is I notice that this point is the highest point in this particular grouping. And this point is the lowest point. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to call that point A. And I'm going to call this one point B. And I'm going to be interested in the coordinates of those points. So this point A has coordinates. I'm going to say that's around, um, let's say, 5.2. And it has a y coordinate of around negative 1.2. And even those are estimates at best. I'm just doing the best I can to eyeball that. This point B, it looks like it's sitting at around, maybe it's at 10 point. It's not quite in the middle. So I'm going to say it's at 10.6 and it's at around negative 6.8. So I'm going to use those as my x and y values for those points. Now why is that useful to me? Well if this one is the maximum and this one is the minimum and if I'm going to use those literally as this is the local maximum and this is the local minimum then there are a few things that I can get out of this right away. If this is, if I'm going to model this as a sinusoidal, then from maximum to minimum, that's going to be half a period. So that means I can actually say from, from here over to here, that's one half of a period. And we commonly use capital T to represent period. But since I know the x coordinate here and I know the x coordinate here, well, that means I can actually find the period because we know there's a relationship. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I can use that to find the period. And then from the period, I can find my k value, for example. Um, so let's see, actually, let's go ahead and fill that in. In this case, I end up with 1 half t is equal to from here back to here. So that's going to be 10.6 minus 5.2. And that is equal to... 5.4. So my period here is, uh, sorry, that's one half t. So t, I get that by multiplying this whole thing by 2, and I end up with 10.8. So that is my period. Uh, let's see, what about from, if I can use my, I'll use green this time, uh, from here, from this maximum down to here, down to this minimum. Well, that is, that's not my amplitude, that's twice my amplitude. So that means that I know that 2 times my amplitude, and it's the absolute value of the amplitude, because I, don't, I haven't decided whether my uh, leading coefficient should be positive or negative. So the amplitude is the absolute value. Well, that's equal to, now, what is this difference from this vertical value to this vertical value? So twice the amplitude is equal to, and you can do this a couple of ways, but I'm going to say, I'm going to do it so I get a positive result, since this really should be positive. So the way you do that is you take the maximum, which is negative 1.2, minus the minimum, which is negative 6.8, and that's not what I wanted. Let's just go ahead with, with what we were doing there. And that's saying that 2 times the amplitude is equal to, so this is going to actually be negative 1.2 plus 6.8. And that works out to be um, 6.8 minus 1.2 is 5.8, 5.6. So I end up with 2 times my amplitude is equal to 5.6. So the magnitude of my amplitude on its own, I divide both sides by 2, and I end up with 2.8 for that value. So I, right away, just visually, I've gotten a couple of things from this graph. Um, what about the, well, let's go forward. I'm, I'm getting kind of cluttered here. Now, I did prepare another page, so let's just carry these values forward. t equals 10.8. So I've already figured out that t is equal to 10.8. And I just figured out that the absolute value of my uh, amplitude was equal to 
And a couple of other things I can do here is I can find my axis of the curve. So this one, it's actually a little bit easier if I kind of just draw it in here. I'm not using this curve. I'm just trying to visualize. My axis of the curve looks like it should be something along that line, right? The axis of the curve. So the way that I find the axis of the curve, and just I'm just going to remind you of what I used here. I used the fact that the amplitude is equal to max minus min divided by 2. Your axis of the curve, which is Q, that's the max plus the min divided by 2. But I can actually go ahead and find that. My maximum, if we look back, just to remind ourselves of the points we used, the maximum was at negative 1.2. The minimum was at negative 6.8. So the maximum is negative 1.2 plus the minimum, which is negative 6.8, divided by 2. And that's equal to, let's see, that's going to be negative, that's actually negative 8.0 divided by 2, which is equal to negative 4.0, or just negative 4. So that's my axis of the curve. Which is also my Q value for my equation. Now the only thing I don't have yet, so I've got my magnitude of A. Oh, I've got my T value here, but the T value is incomplete. I need to use that with the relationship that period is equal to 2 pi divided by K. So if I multiply both sides, or essentially if I cross multiply here, I can rearrange this very easily to be K is equal to 2 pi over the period. So in this case, K is equal to 2 pi over 10.8 and I could reduce this I could divide out the two etc I'm just going to leave this as is just because we're going to be illustrating something a little bit later but if you wanted to change this to a decimal that would be perfectly fine as well because and remember right now I haven't put approximate anywhere but that's because this is a model none of these things are, are expected to be exact so all of these numbers are just my best approximations so I've got my K, I've got my Q, I have part of my A, but I need to figure out the sign of the A. Is it positive or negative? And the way that I do that is actually, I get to choose whether or not this is positive or negative. And the way that I do that is depending on where my phase shift is. So if I've made the choice, and I've been mentioning it a number of times, uh, it's, this could be sine or cos. If I go ahead and choose this to be sine, then I've got my starting point somewhere around here. Now, that was a pretty rough estimate that I did. And I'm also, on the small graph, it's harder to see. So let's go back to the bigger graph. And the axis of the curve was at negative 4, was at y equals negative 4. So if I imagine this coming down through here, then if I imagine this coming down through here, my p-value is going to be, well, somewhere between somewhere between here and here. So I'm going to put my p-value around there. And this is arbitrary. So I put my p-value around there. That looks like around p is equal to 2.2. So, and I, that's arbitrary. You could make the argument, say, oh, you know what? I disagree. That should have been P equals 2.3. That should have been P equals... I don't think you could make the argument for 2.1, but you could have made maybe an argument for P equals 2.3. But I'm going to go ahead with P equals 2.2. And by doing it that way, here's where my sine is starting. My sine curve, S-I-N-E. And if my sine curve is starting there, if my sine curve is starting here, then that means that this, my A value becomes positive. So that becomes 5.8. And now I've got everything I need to write out my equation. I get Y equals, we're saying positive 5.8. I'm using a sinusoidal, or I'm using sine as my sinusoidal. My K value is equal to 2 pi over 10.8 and then it's going to be x minus 2.2 minus 4. So I come up with that model. And 
I've already graphed this, so I took this and I already worked this out in advance. And I went ahead and graphed that model. You can see this matches the numbers that I just put in, I hope, uh, except for one that I just wrote incorrectly. Why did I get A equals 5.8 instead of 2? Oh, because I wrote it incorrectly. A was supposed to be 2.8. And so this A was not supposed to be written as 5.8. It was supposed to be written as 2.8, which means this A should have been written as 2.8. And that means that this A should have been written as 2.8. And now that actually matches this equation. And you can see I graphed that. And it's not a bad graph, but already that's a poor match. That looks that's pretty poor writing as well. So let's try improving that a bit. Poor match. This is a poor match over here. This is pretty decent. This is actually quite good. And then it starts to get a little bit worse, and then it gets a lot worse. So how could we have improved that if we think back to what we originally did? And so when I went through this again, I thought, well, I could have improved this quite a bit by noticing that this is not likely to be the minimum, in the sense that this is not likely to be the minimum point. The minimum point is more likely to be around there. And I'm doing that by symmetry. Here are a couple of points that are about the same y value. And notice that they are 1, 2, 1, 2. Here are a couple of points that are around the same y value. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. But a little bit skewed to the left. So I could have put this, at, I say 7. I meant to say 11 at x equals 11. And or I could have also maybe done x equals 10.9 or 10.95. But I went ahead and redid the model using 11. And when I redid the model using 11, it changed my period. So this value changed right here. And the result of that change was a marked improvement in the overall model. So a very subtle choice, a very different choice. I got it right here, x equals 11. A very different choice here had a fairly significant uh, result. So it, it is important when you're doing your modeling, you have to choose carefully in order to get this to, uh, to work nicely. Otherwise, you're going to get results that are more like this one. And the poorer your model is, the worse your model is going to be at actually following your data and being useful for making predictions. So there's an example of, of doing a uh, an algebraic model using some fairly marginal data and uh, you can see how much you can vary it just with small changes in some of the choices you make when coming up with your equation.